Hi everybody, this is Cal O'Connell. I'm the director of Terminal and uh, one of the producers and I'm making this commentary track really just to sort of give you all an idea of what went into making this film and a little bit of background here and there. It seems as though that the film itself has been pretty popular actually on um, YouTube, so here we go. So Terminal is set in a dystopian future. It's um, set about 200 years from now or so after a great cataclysm that's wiped out most of the planet except of the north of England and Scotland as you can see from that map on the screen there we've got Michaela Longdon here fantastic actress and Tom Barry and Michaela is playing Kim who is a job reassignment officer for the terminal system and what that means is the terminal system is a society that everyone in this new country lives in now whereas you are genetically uh, molecular down to the molecular level even reassigned to a different body and that means you could be potentially put into a different sex or uh, a different size person or you know, whatever that um, a particular job may require so that means that there's a, a number of templates for uh, different job roles like Kim's here is a template for a job officer and uh, Alex's character here is a template for a construction person and um, as and when the genetic material is deemed to be needed elsewhere they get reassigned and ultimately get uh, put into a different body and that raises some interesting questions if you can be a different sex but still hold on to your gender then that creates all sort of interesting ideas of does that does that change the even the need to even have a predefined gender at all so it, It's a very deep question. It's a very deep set of meanings. And so Kim here is uh, not particularly thrilled about the system by this point. She's been doing this a while and she's been constantly telling people who are perf perfectly happy in their job roles and in their lives that they now have to be something else which may be against their will. Not necessarily all the time because some people will think, oh, this, I hate this body or I hate this job and I want to be something else so they get reassigned but in this case in Alex's case he likes construction he likes being in this this form and uh, he's been told no he's gonna he's now gonna be sent off to be turned into a um it turned into a pregnant woman which is uh, a whole different bag for him obviously or well, for them I suppose that would be the case but there we go Now this particular room where we shot this was actually uh, a 360 degree projection room uh, that we set up a, a desk and a computer sort of terminal in there so, to film. So everything on the walls there is shot in camera. And then obviously the computer screens and some other bits are all done uh, later in VFX. Good morning, my name's Kim. I'm here to make your job reassignment as quick as possible. Uh, similarly with this corridor scene, there's no green screen in this. This was a combination of just basic map plates and uh, some um, overlays, really some digital overlays and a combination of uh, a little bit of rotoscoping as well. 95% of this film has a digital effect in it, so obviously including this one. Now this scene, which makes up a good chunk of the film, is made up of a whole variety of different visual effects um, practices I suppose most of which I had to teach myself <laughs> in order to finish this this film after we shot it incidentally we shot this film this entire film was shot in two days with no pickups which was mental thinking about it it was absolutely crazy to do it but we had such a limited budget um, and you know, very very limited time in which lo locations we were able to shoot this in, which equipment we had available to us, 
how available our actresses were, including Sam Mazzano here, who was another fantastic actress. So we had to shoot this thing at breakneck speed. And I think one of my only regrets from this this particular film, this particular project, was that we didn't have longer because I would have loved to have done a lot more in terms of the camera work. But we just didn't have the time. So it was literally basic coverage shot, reverse shot, wide shot for at least half of this scene. Um, whereas I'd intended to do a hell of a lot more, but again, we just we just didn't have the time in the end. So, so in terms of the story here, we've got um, Sam's character, who is um, an even older stalwart, really, of the, uh, the job system. And uh, she's definitely disenfranchised by it. And um, she is meant to represent the femme fatale of this, this kind of sort of um, ne- this kind of futuristic noir uh, film. And she's obviously going to spend a lot of time giving the sob story and then roping uh, Kim into doing something for her, which uh, obviously is Kim's not very comfortable about. So, in terms of the shots, we had an interesting comment on one of the on the actual main film saying this film should be called green screen. And the actual fact is that yeah, okay, there is there is green screen in this used in this quite heavily, but maybe not in all the places you'd think. Um, and I'm f- I've actually started to map out a, a video which goes into detail actually what we did with uh, the green screen technique specifically for these scenes um, which I'll uh, post a link to below once that's finished um, but that probably won't be here for this particular post but yeah this is a, a combination of uh, green screen this particular shot and uh, physical plates that were there on set in that day and we've got the wind blowing in their hair that was the real wind we shot this outside on an actual balcony which was only about a story or two up so nothing as high as depicted here in uh, futuristic Manchester. We also shot this in York, not Manchester, so that was uh, another another difference, but, you know, there we go. And this was a tricky scene to do, again, because, you know, it's quite a long scene. We had the weather to contend with. Um, we were shooting on a single-unit camera, uh, no additional lighting. We had uh, the... Both our actors here were... Uh, mic'd up with uh, an undervest uh, mic and we tried to get a boom in it as we could but as you can see the wind is quite high here so you know the uh, wind kind of neutered the uh, the boom mic a fair bit but again these two really absolutely nailed this scene I'm so happy with what they did and everything they're doing really in this scene is just to sort of help flesh out the the background of really what the terminal is this this society that they live in and really how it's it's a forced equality system. So it's a neo... I don't know what you'd call it, actually. We tried, we didn't properly define this, I guess, but it's a neo... maybe neoliberal or something like that. But essentially, there, the idea probably started as that, uh, you know, it was... this system was started to ensure that everyone was equal. They were all treated on equal levels, and then as it's got older and further along, it's become... it's strayed further and further from its course, so it's actually forcing equality on people rather than offering them equality. And that was really what the the quote at the start was about um, by uh, Dick Figler, saying, saying, equality of opportunity is freedom, but equality of outcome is repression and that's really where it sort of really where it sort of goes so it started out with the best of intentions to save people i guess but then uh, it became something far more sinister and there's a lot more underlying story to this universe than we talk about in the film mainly because it's a short mostly it's a long short but it's a short and um but we wanted we loved the idea that we'd potentially still have more story to tell if we ever did a feature or continued the story as a feature or even maybe as another short who knows if it deemed popular enough why not if not then well it's it's here isn't it <laughs> it's online for everyone to see this film was completed in 20, early 2019 just in time for its premiere at the Starburst International Film Festival and it took 2 days to shoot this film and then uh, probably six months for me to individually work on the the VFX 
because as I said, you know, 95% of this film has some form of, of VFX in it. Won't tell anyone, but I can't. You're but like the components you can see in the background here, we've got the, the future, a future Manchester, which is actually made up of a number of different cities and sort of constructed it as a digital map painting. We've got elements like the windmills in the backgrounds there. We've got the sky, which is um, an animated cloud line. We've got the posters there in the background. So all those are different elements which go into making that just that background. And we made a great big, a great big sort of vista, really, that then gets sort of moved around in between shots. I might say those things when I'm angry and I've had a bad day, but I. There's no green screen in this one. This is a sky replacement and tracking, for example. Truly equal. No. Same with that one. Sky replacement, no green screen. Same with that one. And there's one thing we really learnt in this shoot, really, it's... We went in with at least 50% of an idea of how we'd achieve the shots that I wanted to achieve. Um, and sometimes they worked and others we did, they didn't, but we didn't have the facility to go back and reshoot anything. So it, it forces you, it forced me, to be really creative with how I went about achieving the shots that I wanted, like, say, here, the skyline we thought would be a, a simple sky replacement shot ended up being an absolute pain because of the wind and because we shot this at 25 frames per second on the original Ursa Mini Pro in ProRes um, there was lots of issues with the hair flapping around and trying to key that properly making sure that it didn't sort of blare it too much and most of the time it works it's not perfect but again you know this is things you learn along the way and um, it's probably could do a lot better now but that's you know just the nature of filmmaking you you do the best you can with what you've got at the time the main thing was really just to keep at this i think i actually did the vfx three times on this scene to get it to look like i wanted it to look like or rather sort of tweaked it three con significant times to get it to look like what i wanted it to look like um, which include the the uh, final grade here as well. At one point it was really blue, <laughs> which I remember I sent uh, a scene of this to Michaela for her showreel and she just said, it's really blue. It's like, oh, yeah, I guess it is. So that kind of perspective forces you to go back and change things. But the, rain, the rain's digital as well. Thank you, After Effects. How can I? We've got some um, fantastic, that's my voice there. We've got some fantastic sound work done by uh, Wakash Shah, who's uh, did our final mix and added in all the cool background noises and the storm and all this. That was a lot of fun to put that shot together with the lightning and reflections and things. All digital, obviously. This scene here is really interesting because originally Alex, who has now been... Um, transitioned I suppose into the female uh, the mother of the unit if you want to call it that um, was originally supposed to be looking out into a the facilities that in fact actually turn the people into one body from one body into another but we just couldn't get it to work for what we what I knew how to do at the time so this ended up being the very last scene I sort of finished off and towards the end I got an idea and spoke to Max our writer Maxine G and I said what instead? What about instead of her looking out into these vats and these this this laboratory? What if she's just like looking out through a, a window that's uh, pro playing a lot of propaganda to her? And so we recorded this uh, voiceover in the background, and it just ended up working much better in the end because it helped sell the the universe a little bit better rather than showing us something which we've already essentially been told about. So even at that late stage, we were adding adding things. <laughs> And that worked really well. This was all shot in the same building, which is the um, the business and law building at York University. And they were kind enough to uh, let us use this place for free, actually, for a couple of days. So um, that worked out really nicely. And they had this this really nice boardroom. Oh, this really nice board-looking room, this meeting room, um, for us to shoot this uh, this scene with uh, our next actor here, Jason Deere. My name came. And this is again m mostly practical in as far as what you see. I mean, you can obviously guess <laughs> what was added. 
like the sign on the door there was digitally added as the logo. The screen there is a green screen. Um, the computer screens to the back of him and to the left of him on the screen there, they were added in, as in the, the displays were added in in post. And the sky to the right is a sky replacement with uh, the animated cloud layer and the, the weather thrown in there for added effect. And then obviously the final grade. And then a few bits on the ceiling were removed or changed to... Um, just uh, clean up the shot a little bit and just make it look a bit nicer. You mentioned the system running slow twice. We had this plant which was supposed to feature in this. <laughs> it's just one of those things you think, oh, that'll look cool on camera. And then when you get to it, you think, nope, it doesn't work at all. So we ended up ejecting it on the day. We ended up keeping that plant for about two years after this. Maybe I was just using it wrong. So yeah, a lot of green screen in this, just in as far as the background screen goes. And that's just you know, day to day camera feeds. Um, a lot of purchased stock actually, which just made life a lot easier in that sense. And again, sky replacement there with the animated cloud layer and the rain thrown in. Obviously enhanced by the sound effects, the uh, effects work thrown in by our sound editor, or car. Well, that all looks pretty good. This had a little bit more lighting in the most other scenes. Um, it, was it was obviously quite dark in there, but we, again, I wanted to maintain a sort of a real world lighting feel for this as possible. Um, again, for speed as well, because again, we had two days to shoot this and we shot this entire scene in an afternoon. It took a bit longer than we were expecting, but this was the uh, second half of the first day. And uh, we, I think we literally had two panel lights in this to shoot this. But um, again, you know, we went in with a certain amount of prep. We could have gone in with more, I think, now. But again, you know, you work with what you know at the time. And now I would prep a hell of a lot more than I did for this. Assignments. And the nerve bank's pretty... F but again, you could probably always come out of every shoot that you do and go, oh, actually, yeah, I could have done more there. But, you know, you do what you do at the time, so... But we did storyboard this. Um, we did an, an, an animatic storyboard, or a really basic animatic storyboard, just to help us uh, work out the the feel of the film. But um, what that didn't, we didn't necessarily do it properly. In as far as we thought originally that this actually, by the end of it, this film would be something like twenty minutes long at the most, and it ended up obviously being nearly half an hour long, which made it really difficult to festivalize. Incidentally, that's something else I'd talk about at another point, maybe. Festivals don't like long shorts. Most festivals won't like a short more than, say, 12 to 15 minutes on average. So obviously getting this into festivals, especially the bigger ones, which we really wanted to get into, was really, really difficult. But um, some festivals like longer shorts, you know, it's, um, they can do them as featured ones, but they don't tend to be all that common because they want to uh, get as many films on a particular showing as possible. And obviously half an hour long shorts don't really make that very viable, especially for submissions. This job, you only appeared this morning. And by tomorrow, someone would have already filled the role. So a little bit more exposition into the background here, and then obviously the big reveal as to what is actually going on in the story. If you haven't seen the film already, I mean, go back and watch it, and then hopefully you'll uh, get a better understanding of it. But if you have, and you uh, have any questions about the actual script the story that max wrote um just uh, leave a comment below and um i'd love to love to hear your thoughts or your questions and i'll try and answer them as best i can jay i think i'll do anything to be with Vic. they saw something odd hanging out the window of a i always love the black and white flashbacks it kind of reminds me a little bit of uh the Battlestar Galactica reboot. Although they didn't do black and white, but they went really sort of old and grainy, and I remember thinking that, but black and white kind of was a bit of a throwback to that sort of original noir kind of kind of style. I think this probably could have worked really well as a black and white film, actually, which would have been interesting. So, But uh, we went for these very contrasty, deep kind of colours, rather than it being too sort of flat, which... A lot of people tend to be doing at the moment, which I don't necessarily agree with. But I think, uh, again, because this, I wanted this to have a, a particular noir feel to it, the richer, the richer colours, the deeper shadows, I think work well with this. Let's talk of deviant behaviour. Uh, the film was shot in 2K ProRes on the Ursa Mini Pro, the original Ursa Mini Pro. Uh, shot in 2K rather than 4, 
or whatever the unit was able to do at the time, I can't remember off the top of my head now, but simply because we didn't have enough storage and it took ages to copy across the files and obviously being ProRes the files were massive. If we'd had the ability to shoot raw footage that we can do on the ESAs now, it probably would have been half the file size, ironically. But Don't underestimate how long it takes to edit a scene, if for any of you editors out there as well. It took me probably four weeks to get this scene to work. Um, just until I was happy with it, basically. There's a long story behind it, which I haven't really got time to go into now. But, yeah, it took me ages to uh, get it to work. I'm not unhappy with it, but I think if there was anything I would have wanted to reshoot, if we'd had the time and the budget, I think it would be this scene. Not for the performance there by Michaela or Jason, it's just, you know, again, not necessarily having the time to spend how you'd want to spend it. But still, I'm not, dis I'm not dissatisfied with it. It's just you're always looking at something you've done and thinking, oh, yeah, I wish I could do that better next time. Shot on the same day as the first balcony scene, uh, towards the end of the day, in fact. So we actually had the uh, the later light uh, to help us out with selling the fact that the light is um, obviously supposed to be the evening. And again, this is all natural light. There's no additional lighting other than some reflection uh, from some small meter, meter radial reflectors, which you can just about make out in Sam's eyes on the side there. This is green screen with uh, the plates shot at the back so the balcony is real the balcony ledge there is real uh, so we shot Michaela Sam with behind a green screen then we shot a separate plate without moving the camera or shifting the focus to shoot the uh, a plate of the balcony there and then obviously the rest of it is uh, is digital through mats and uh, matte paintings and things Mat masks masking I should say and matte paintings. Tell anyone I'll be punished alongside you for substituting the job list. And if you're ever making a film that is like this, sci-fi speaking, or maybe even if it's not, if you think about, if you're thinking about how can I enhance this or build a world around them without it even existing, you don't always have to go down a fully CG route in as far as you know model making and things like this. Try and find stock photography. You know, if you've got a Getty account, maybe, if you can afford that, or if you've got a, a big stock account, or even if you've got a camera and you live in a really interesting looking place, go out and shoot the assets and learn how to make matte paintings because they really, really helped to, um, to sell this idea. Originally, all this background was going to be completely CG, as in model made from scratch in, say, Blender or something, but it just uh, would have taken too long and it wouldn't have looked, looked real in the slightest for sort of the budget level we were working at. Um, incidentally, the shooting the shooting budget for this film was £1,500, so really, really tiny. And post-production was, you know, probably another thousand in the end. We had an original score made by a um, great composer called uh, Benjamin Simons. Check him out, he does some great work. Edited by myself, visual effects by myself, again, to save money. And, you know, we always try and pay people. This is always the thing. We always try and pay people, but we still had a lot of volunteers on this, friends and friends of friends helping out. So, you know, real massive thanks to them. 36, report to your job centre officer, please. That's almost entirely practical. Again, that's the, that's the projection at the back there with the computer screen being the only VFX component with a little bit of matte paintings, but I wonder if you could spot where it was. And that's to elude that final shot there, to elude that there's more story. What will Kim do with this contact? Will she contact this mysterious group of people? Are they a resistance movement? Are they going to try and start an uprising? <laughs> I'll leave you to, uh, to decide. But that's it, so whilst I've got this overly long credit sequence, which is another thing I'll say to you filmmakers out there, keep your credit sequences short. There's absolutely no need to do what I did here and make it ridiculously long. Um, I could have shaved nearly five minutes off the film, which would have made a, probably a big difference to the running time as far as the festivals were concerned, but there we go. 
keep your keep your credit sequences as short as possible um so yep there we go there's some ramblings for me for 28 or so minutes if you've got any questions about the production or about the film itself about the story about any of the performers or any of the technical aspects that went into this just drop me a comment below um if you liked listening to this give a thumbs up or a thumbs down either way it helps it helps the channel grow so definitely would appreciate that and keep your eyes open for a video that will be talking specifically about the vfx side of things um how i did the vfx and what things to consider when doing or designing your VFX and shooting your VFX shots for something like this. So, quick mention to our uh, props guy, props master Kev Brooks, who passed away um, last year. So, um, massive respect to him. He was always a big supporter of ours and um, he's very much missed. Also, Leanne there, she's the original found, one of the original founders of Row Pictures, incidentally. So yeah, that's it from me. Thanks very much for watching, for listening. Thanks very much if you've been a supporter of the film and the channel for a while now. Um, I'm going to try and make more content for this um, as time allows. Um, so yeah, stay safe out there. Be well. And if you're creatives especially, keep on creating. And uh, I, I shall speak to you again really, really soon. <laughs>